more advanced domain where uh, we're going to talk about uh, you know, some uh, fancy and mathematically more complicated aspect of graphic models. So you will see more equations, more mathematics, and uh, I may go fast at some point and slow at some point, but uh, now it's time for you to really be serious about the assignment, the, the readings, okay? Because the reading will give you a lot of uh, help and guidance in understanding the whole context. It is usually impossible to cover the, all the details in a particular lecture. The lecture will give you maybe one or two instances clearly explained, but the field is very big. So uh, to begin with, let's talk about approximate inference and a particular type of them called a variational inference. And uh, you know, you probably heard this name very often already, right? Variational inference, this word has been abused in many ways to uh, refer to many, many different things. And hopefully in the next few lectures, we can make the whole thing straight so that you know exactly what they mean. So just to you know, uh, you know, prepare us a little bit you know, I, uh, to make the, this particular lecture self-contained, let's uh, go over a few typical inference problems. Right? So inference problem is really about addressing such type of queries, such as computing likelihood, you know, computing a marginal, computing a conditional, or computing a max uh, configuration okay, of uh, either the whole or the subset of random variables. And, uh, the technique we learned so far, you know, are uh, pretty much like this, right? One is uh, a brute force. We know how to mean, uh, what do we mean by brute force, right? We just have this big table and we enumerate all configurations and uh, once we, uh, we can basically uh, sum over all the entries, okay, to uh, add up things together. And that's obviously an exponentially complex operation. Then we have the next technique to be called elimination where we focus on that query being asked. And then we're going to you know, eliminate mathematic, uh, algebraically or graphically nodes in the graphical model until we reach to the sub subset of nodes that we are interested in. And usually that gives you something proportional to the marginal of that query. And then you can do a local manipulation. But we also uh, realize that the limitation of uh, elimination is that uh, it's a query specific. And uh, once you've, you are done with this query and you are going to work on other query, this elimination is going to be useless. You need to redo it. So it's kind of expensive still, even though the algorithm itself can be polynomial, but you need to do this polynomial for every query. Then after that, we learned a better trick, which is called message passing, which is uh, a uh, graph propagation algorithm. You just uh, uh, pretend or assume that uh, you're going to answer all the queries possibly asked uh, on the graphic model, and then I derive a message passing algorithm that uh, visit every node in the graphic model, you know, at least uh, twice, forward time and backward time, so that, uh, you know, the message is passed on every edge in the graphic model uh, in both directions. And then, you know, if the graphic model is uh, a nice one, then that's going to lead to a convergent solution. Then the message itself gives you, you know, some uh, useful information such as the marginal of the query random variables, right? So that's the three algorithms we learned so far. And, uh, and actually this is, uh, you know, a uh, example of that message passing algorithm which uses this uh, sum product operation, right? So on any graphic model, you know, you basically focus on a node and then you do a local operation, collecting all the messages, all but one, you know, from the neighborhood, and then use uh, this equation, I uh, use this equation to compute the message going out of this node, right? And then you send it to the other node. And uh, such an operation can be taken place asynchronously on everywhere in the graph, right? And uh, then, you know, if this graph is a tree, as we remember, it will be convergent, right? Because uh, why, anybody still remember why if it is a tree, then it is going to converge or it is going to be correct? Maybe just one single insight. It doesn't have to be exactly pinpointing mathematically what's happening, but a simple insight if you can remember. What characterizes a tree? No circle also means that uh, between any pair of nodes, there's only one pass, right? And once you send a message you know, through one pass, there's no way for them to be inconsistent. 
it, because it has to be only consistent with itself. So once the inference algorithm is locally correct, then it is globally correct. Right? So that's the, the key insight. And then when we run into a complicated graph like a junction tree, uh, like, like a, a, you know, a, a, you know, a, a, a graph waste cycle, and the one way to rescue is to create a tree out of it. Right? We can make it a tree uh, in terms of a tree over uh, you know, maybe uh, bigger units. Right? For example, when we learned a, a procedure called the junction tree algorithm, where we need to turn this graph into a junction tree through an operation called triangulation. We haven't really covered too much about triangulation. It's a big deal, actually, in the older literature of graphic model, how to do triangulation. If you are interested, you can read Daphne Kohler's book. They, she has a very, very nice, you know, uh, and the, in the precise and detailed illustration of uh, how that happens. But basically, the bigger idea is that, uh, you know, you just, uh, you know, look at your graph, and if you see any cycle with more than three nodes, you need to triangulate it by putting a chord, okay, in between. So, obviously, with uh, this, the most easiest way to see is to put the chord here, here, here. So you eliminate these uh, four triangle, uh, four cycles, right? But uh, then you have this uh, new four cycle, right? And uh, then what do you do? Well, the new four cycle seems to be uh, having a chord, but uh, this chord is passing a node. Therefore, that is not, uh, you know, a chord for this four cycle. Therefore, you need to put an uh, arc in here, you know, something like this, right? So with such operation, essentially. At the end of the day, in your graph, you don't have any four cycles, okay, or bigger cycles. And that basically provides you the material for building a junction tree, which is like this. Okay, you do a uh, maximum spanning tree algorithm to basically, you know, a maximum tree, maximum spanning tree algorithm on the clicks, okay, from this graph, and then you get a junction tree. And then you can run message passing on trees. Clear? That's basically all we can do from exact inference. Okay, so, and uh, the, uh, the algorithm is pretty straightforward, and uh, I don't think there's a need to go over that. You know, we have a uh, you know, message going back and forth, getting recalibrated, so on and so forth. And uh, again, let me make explicit what uh, this uh, junction tree algorithm and all message passing algorithms are trying to enforce. Okay. The key information here is that uh, we believe local consistency leads to global consistency. So what do we mean by local consistency? So Precisely, these are the definition of local consistency. First of all, every marginal, okay, remember that we define all messages on either the bigger clique or the separator clique, right? So this is the separator clique, and this is the natural clique in the graph. And uh, that's basically where your potential function or your message can be defined. Then for any, you know, potential or uh, any uh, marginal on the clique, including the separate clique or the whole clique, they have to be self-normalizable. That's for sure, right? Because they have to be a legal probabilistic distribution. Okay? So this one is uh, a local consistency. And secondly, if there are, you know, these uh, overlapping cliques, uh, which actually defines also on, you know, uh, is a separator clique uh, uh, intersection, which is called S, then the clique function or the potential, uh, the, the marginal function over this uh, separator clique and uh, over this uh, bigger clique must satisfy this property in which if you marginalize this one over the variables outside of the separator, the resultant marginal should be equal to the marginal on the clique, right? And this will happen for both this and that. Therefore, these two, you know, marginals or local functions, even though they reflect in different ways, you know, the property of this uh, intersection, they reflect the same thing, right? That's why they are locally consistent. And this is an in, important property to maintain global consistency if you have a tree. All right, so now the story stops in a model like this. This is a problem we ran into a, a long time ago already, right? For inference, on you know a you know a, you know a you know a uh, a problem where uh, labels or information uh, depends on the neighborhood. In many way or in many cases, you prefer a complex model like this, a Markov-Rosen field, or maybe another graphic model where you have a lot of nodes, right? And uh, for this, I think we told before that. Uh, you know, an inference problem is simply intractable even though you use a junction tree algorithm. 
Okay, so just to review, why we conclude junction tree algorithm is infeasible for this model. These are just quick review that uh, uh, we, we've covered before, just to help you refresh some uh, knowledge. What do we use as a quantity to define the complexity of uh, a graphical model? If you remember that uh, key quantity. We call them tree widths, right? It is uh, the, the, the size of the biggest clique in your junction tree, minus one or something like that, right? So tree widths, that's a concept you have to remember. And the, what is the tree width of this guy? Suppose it is a n by n grid. What is the tree width of this? Uh -huh. No rush, I'll give you some. N minus one? Okay, for some reason I believe it is N, but you know, at least the conclusion will be right. In the N minus one or N gets you to a complexity of two to the power of N, but the tree width itself is N or N minus one. So here is why n is, it is n plus, the actual size of the clique is n plus one because uh, you, know, you remove this, right? And uh, you connect that, and uh, you connect uh, you know, all this. At the end of the day, you are going to get a clique which is actually this guy. <laughs> this is your biggest uh, clique, okay? And uh, then it is n plus one, then trade width is that minus one. But in any case, in any way, uh, it is uh, a pretty big function because uh, in the image you have maybe a, a, a thousand pixel or more, right? So what can you do with that? Okay, so today we're going to now uh, 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 talk about uh, a number of uh, different ways to, uh, uh, you know, to address this problem, okay? And uh, that's basically where we want to begin our coverage on approximate inference. Again, as I mentioned in the Friday's lecture, unfortunately many of you guys wasn't here, but hopefully you watched the video already. You know, there is a clear dichotomy between the inference algorithm and the model itself, okay? A good model can be ruined by a bad inference algorithm, and, uh, and uh, a good inference algorithm may be useless if you have a bad model, okay? So when you actually are doing a machine learning solution, especially for non-trivial cases, you have to visit these two issues separately, okay, to make sure that what's going wrong with your whole program, okay. For example, if you want to check the model, then I suggest you spend some time getting the inference algorithm uh, not so sloppy. Even say you have to spend a lot of time, you know, doing exact inference may be really tedious, but uh, if you wait for months, you can still do it, right? It's just not uh, five minutes. But at least uh, that makes you sure it is correct. Then if under a correct inference, your model is still not doing the thing you want to do, you conclude the model is bad, okay? Then otherwise, if you really believe the model is good, okay, because your friend told you so, or some expert told you so, therefore uh, you have no intention to check the model anymore, then you are going to check different algorithms to try different approximation and so on and so forth. But you don't want to blend these two together, tweaking the model, tweaking the algorithm, and then making them a, you know, a, uh, a gradient descent rather than a coordinate descent. You just try to combine these two together in your search of a better solution. It's guaranteed not to work, okay? That's why, you know, you know, at some point, I think a few years ago when graphic model technique isn't very popular, I heard uh, tons of complaints from computer vision community. They complain that uh, Macron field is such a terrible model because uh, they just don't know how to do the right inference on Macron field. Okay, doing a mean field approximation, as I'm gonna tell you today, is totally disastrous for that kind of models. Okay. All right, so there are a lot of uh, approximate inference algorithm, and roughly I divide them into three different blocks. And uh, today we're going to, actually today and the next few uh, lectures, we're going to visit the first called the variational inference. Variational inference has this uh, character that it turns a uh, probabilistic inference problem into a deterministic optimization problem, sometimes a convex optimization problem, okay? So that you can have strong characterization 
of the solution. But with respect to the approximating loss function, okay, to turn the original problem into a variational problem, you have to change the problem into a different one. Therefore, you are actually solving a different problem. It's slightly simpler. Then in that different problem, you have the option to solve them exactly or approximately. And those solutions can usually be characterized with theoretical analysis. But uh, the approximation you introduced in redefining the problem sometimes is uncharacterizable. So there are actually various uh, styles of variational inferences, and the many of them are subject to debate. But it is an extremely efficient algorithm because it is uh, a deterministic optimization, right? like a gradient, for example. The second uh, approach is uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo, or actually not Markov chain, but Monte Carlo in general. Okay, Markov chain Monte Carlo is one style of that. That's uh, a more flexible and uh, and the more accurate algorithm asymptotically. Statisticians really, at, at some point, they believe that's the only way to deal with graphical models or high dimensional models. Nowadays, some statisticians start to turn to this for pragmatic reason, but uh, this style of algorithm had their position in the field. Okay, it is uh, historically very important and it is very easy to implement. We are going to learn a few tricks about that. If we have time, we'll learn a stochastic simulation version of both. Basically, both can be turned stochastic and you will find out what one by stochastic. So let's first start with uh, a, uh, a uh, very high level uh, uh, understanding about what do we mean by approximate inference or what we mean by inference. So at the end of the day, we say that uh, inference is about answering a, approximate, uh, a query, say P of uh, X, A, right? And approximate inference means that uh, we need to have uh, some approximate answer to that, right? And, uh, you know, for example, if I say, you know, P of uh, this equal to one, is that an approximate inference? or I can put an arbitrary number, 0.5. That is approximate inference, right? Basically, I'm just, I'm just guessing a number to that true value, which I don't know. As long as my guess is not outrageous, say this is becoming 10, of course it's outrageous, it's not even probability. But uh, if I'm doing a rational guess, it is a approximate inference. So there are many ways for getting you the number in here, okay? And when I guess this one, I'm not even thinking about uh, what is the probability of X, which is the joint distribution of the entire thing or the whole model, right? I don't even thought about that. I think about that, right? So that's actually a essence we have to now start uh, appreciating, you know, in approximate inference literature or even other inference problem. You know, once uh, your problem is defined to be, you know, a, a particular query, a style of query, say, solving, you know, you know, uh, marginals or something, sometimes you can focus your solution directly on the type of query without uh, actually caring about uh, the original model anymore, okay? And that's actually where the variational inference literature is taking advantage of, okay? And uh, yeah, and uh, in MCMC, that's uh, less of a popular concept. The statisticians, you know, you really want to maintain the better, the, the, the bigger picture to be correct, and uh, I have the right representation of the entire distribution, and then I'm going to, you know, get anything out of it. But the variational inference is a much more direct approach. All right, so let's start with the first algorithm. This first algorithm, I, I really liked it because, uh, you know, I have some kind of funny connection with it, and because I witnessed the, the kind of uh, the, uh, the, the acknowledgement of this algorithm from being a heuristic to a, a very nice, you know, principled, theoretically well-motivated work. And I myself use it at some point. So just to uh, uh, begin from a weaker case, let's remember what is a belief propagation. Again, this is the nth time that we see it. We should be all familiar with that. It is uh, basically computing a message on the edge by collecting message coming into this node and uh, also multiply them with uh, potentials that involves the sending node and the receiving node, right? And uh, we have names for that. These uh, potentials are really called uh, compatibility at some point to make sure that these two are compatible by the shared potential function they involved. 
and there are external evidences coming from other parts of the graph, okay? And uh, once uh, we pass these messages, uh, say twice, and uh, then we have a stable messages on the graph, and then once we want to compute a query, say marginal of this one, we do that. Right? So that's pretty straightforward. And this graph is a tree. Just to uh, make sure we understand now the structure of the message, I want to give you two forms. So here is the original graph. Okay, the, uh, oh, actually the, the graph re-represented as a factored graph because in factored graph we made explicit the variable nodes and also the click nodes. Okay, and uh, on variable nodes and on click nodes we can both define uh, marginals or messages and uh, they all follow the same form but uh, their uh, rule of uh, passing messages is a little bit different, right? So here, for example, here I have a message coming out of a variable into a, a click, okay? And then that's basically the messages itself from uh, all the variables, okay? So there are messages from uh, what? Yeah, these are basically other messages. Say this is, so suppose this is I, for example, okay? Then it will receive other messages from this click, that click, and that click, then it sends to this click, okay? And then we have also the messages coming out of the click into a node, and then, you know, other than multiplying the messages it received from other uh, variables, it should also multiply a potential function defined on the click itself, because we said that, uh, you know, the in, in the factor graph, you know, every, every click is represented by a node. Therefore, the potential function is only defined on the click nodes, right? So therefore, it apply, it multiply this one. But uh, if you just uh, don't want to confuse or distinguish click and variable, then these two messages are pretty much the same thing, right? All right, we're going to reuse this later on, but remember the form of uh, these messages. Okay, very, very interesting form. All right, so now let's look at uh, a complicated case. We have uh, a tree graph, and uh, what if uh, I put some more edges to make them into a grid? Now we have cycles, right? And uh, let's first decide that we don't want to run junction tree because uh, if the graph is big, that kind of effort is in vain. I'm going to run into you know, the, the, the explosion of tree widths and stuff like that. Therefore, we don't believe that algorithm is scalable. But uh, we can you know, try something else. So how about uh, we just uh, apply the message passing algorithm without any change on this graph, okay, with the definition of the messages exactly defined as before. We just pretend that we don't know the structure of the graph because it's a local operation. I just don't look globally. I just do the local message passing as if uh, I'm on a tree graph, okay? We kind of uh, said that uh, in some examples, this is going to lead to inconsistency, remember that? But uh, uh, interestingly, because I don't have any choice, you know, if I have a bigger graph with uh, hundreds of nodes, I really don't have a choice of doing exact anyway. So I'm going to use this algorithm anyway because that's the only one I have at disposal, okay? Remember there are, you know, 20 years ago, uh, the machine learning people are not so statistical. Many of them actually don't appreciate or even don't know MCMC, Monte Carlo methods. And the other algorithms at disposal is a kind of a message passing or other heuristic. So they would uh, use it anyway. So nothing prevents us doing that, right? So operationally it worked. And uh, empirically you may not converge, but what if you do converge? All right, so that's basically an uh, interesting kind of uh, practice. It leads to a, people at least hope that uh, this operation will lead to a fixed point iteration, that uh, once you, you know, pass this message, you know, in the tree graph, you pass it twice, you get convergence, right? And here, if it doesn't converge, how about we just keep passing it? And in a fixed point iteration, we actually never know how many steps it will converge, but we have the faith that it will converge at some point, because uh, in fixed point iteration, in a principled way, we know the loss function is convex. You know, every step is essentially cor corresponding to a coordinate descent, and we're going to converge. In here, even though we don't have that kind of uh, geometric picture, maybe things are like that, right? So that's basically what people 
you know, is hoping for. They are going to run this algorithm, start with a random initialization, okay, random initialization, and then we are going to do this uh, message passing like this. You know, look, look at the equation. It is exactly the same as I did before because you can write the same factor tree graph, a factored graph, not factor tree, as I did before, and uh, deploy this algorithm. And, uh, and uh, of course, at, if it's converging, then the stationary property is guaranteed because it will not change anymore down the road, right? Even though that the convergence is not guaranteed. In fact, uh, if you are curious, you can try such a thing on a number of uh, graphic models that is cyclic. You will see that sometimes you will see a cyclic results. The, the outcome is jumping from here to here and then back to here, back to here. They just don't converge at all. That's, that happens. Okay. So that's basically uh, what's uh, happening to many ML researchers, you know, uh, in the, I think in the late 90s, the time I was about to enter uh, grad school in, in, in computer science. And uh, so there is a need actually at least to look, look at this, this business more systematically. So this couple of authors, actually it's mainly the, the initiative of Kevin Murphy, uh, who actually was my first office mate at Berkeley. He actually did an empirical study. Okay, if you look at his paper, it's a very interesting paper. Uh, he collected as best as he can. At that time, all the fancy graphic models that is available in the literature. There are some Bayesian network, there are some grids, and some HMM, some chains, and other things. And uh, he basically runs all the, uh, 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 run, uh, uh, HM, uh, run this uh, uh, belief propagation. In fact, now, you know, people don't really want to call it a heuristic, but uh, that uh, algorithm is called uh, belief propagation. Then they call them loopy belief propagation. It sounds like a legitimate algorithm, even though it's just a heuristic, right? So he runs the loopy belief propagation on all these graphs. And that's actually, I believe, uh, was uh, the result of one of the class project in a class like this. Mike just arrived at Berkeley and started his uh, first uh, graphic model class in 99. And uh, of course, students are very excited and uh, they got exposed to the issue that uh, BP is non-convergent. But the BP has, can be applied, uh, deployed on a number of uh, different uh, models. Then you know, one student, Kevin Murphy, just found curious about this. He just collected all these instances and uh, ran BP, but he does one more thing, which is that uh, he makes the different types of graphic model in a controllable size that uh, he can still code up something to run exact inference. For example, if I have a grid of 10 by 10, 10 by 10 binary, it's uh, okay size. In fact, uh, you, know, uh, you know, it's just uh, 100 node Two to the power of 100 is not too bad. You can actually manage it, you know, just by enumerate every state. So you can do exact inference, okay, on a graph model like that. And then you have the ground truth, and then you run the BP, the loopy BP on that, and you compare what you get over there to the true result you get. One can be obtained in one minute, the other can be obtained uh, by a week, but still it's comparable, right? That's also an approach I took in one of my paper in 04. Yeah. I did a uh, easing model with about 20 nodes, and I used a cluster in my, in my department and enumerate all the states you know, for a, a 20 by 20 you know, easing model, still doable. But uh, by that, you can now validate the quality of a, a product inference algorithm. And as a result, he published this very, very famous paper okay, called the empirical study. He found the following uh, phenomenon. Uh, first of all, the algorithm is very, interest, uh, is very simple. In the run loopy BP, and uh, you know, uh, not converging, that's fine. Let's run it anyway and hope for the best, okay? In fact, uh, he's smart enough not to wait indefinitely. He will say either stop after a fixed number of iterations because you know, things start to cyclic because you don't really see progress. Or you can stop when a there is no significant change in the belief, okay? That value is kind of platooning even though every time there is a 10 to the minus six amount of change, you don't worry about that, you can stop. And, uh, and, uh, uh, if, uh, and they actually found the following phenomenon. That's actually a very insightful finding. He found that you either do not converge oscillating, okay, but uh, sometimes it, it does converge. 
for whatever reason. And uh, if it converges, they found that the results are actually not bad. They are quite good compared to the exact answer you can get from exact inference. Okay. Let me tell you this. You have a 2 to the power of n, okay? And uh, what's the, 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 the complexity of that? Exponential, right? And the message passing, what is the computer complexity? It's basically order of n. You iterate n are the number of variables. That's roughly the number of messages you need to, you need to, you need to handle. In iteration, you never iterate over tens of thousands of times. You iterate uh, maybe 30 times, 100 times, 10 times, right? So it's a linear to n. And here is exponential to n. If you have a graph model of a thousand node. As compared to like pulling. Yeah, yeah. So that's basically the, 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 the whole point. Message passing is a polynomial algorithm. Just remember that. And for whatever problem, we prefer a polynomial over exponential, even though sometimes exponential is not, 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 that, not that bad if my n is very small. All right, so what's going on? That's the question I want to ask. So that paper was very important in the late 90s uh, to first expose to people this algorithm may have something interesting in it rather than just a, a, a dirty heuristic because it does manage to get uh, uh, you know, good answers on certain model even though the procedure itself may be theoretically flawed. Okay, okay and uh, now let's uh, uh, start asking what's going on. I, you know, that was a, uh, personally, I had a very uh, strong, uh, you, know, uh, you know, feeling about this because uh, I was in that very kind of uh, period of time where variational inference really take off and uh, start, uh, you know, uh, getting a lot of help from mathematicians and the statisticians. And this is one of these uh, very good examples. There are a few papers coming out of MIT at that point. Uh, first authored by Yair Weiss and a few other, Yadidia and uh, a few others. Uh, they started uh, actually uh, a, I think the paper was posted on my website. They started a very insightful, actually a uh, bridging effort in connecting this algorithm with the traditional physics literature and find that uh, what is happening here is actually resolving a you know, half century old physics problem that used to win a Nobel Prize, okay? And uh, that physics problem actually helped to provide the foundation of the legitimacy of uh, this operation. So here I'm going to quickly go through that. All right, so just to prepare you a little, a little bit uh, uh, nomenclature and the background, uh, let's talk about uh, approximate inference in general, okay? Then we, we go back to the specific problem. The, Distribution that we want to deal with in general is this, uh, you know, uh, Gibbs distribution, how to, if you call it like this, or, you know, any basically graphic model defined on potential functions. And uh, when we say we need a approximate distribution, uh, we need a, 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 a approximate inference solution, usually it can be translated into the following sentence. We want to find a easier distribution, Q, that uh, is a good approximation to the P. Because why we need approximation usually means that P is too, too difficult to handle. Therefore, we find the easy one, okay, Q. And uh, let's imagine Q to be arbitrary at this point. And then we need to, the second question we need to ask is uh, how good the approximate is, right? Therefore, we define a metric called, the, not metric, a divergence function called the KL divergence. By definition, it is, this, it is the expectation of the log odds of the original and the target. Okay, and uh, everybody should understand what's the KL, right? They have some nice property, uh, some interesting property. For example, the KL divergence is always a positive one, and uh, they are equal to zero only and on if and only if the two distributions being compared are equivalent. They are asymmetric, okay? If you put uh, KL of uh, one to two, then they are not equal to KL versus uh, of two to one, okay? and uh, therefore it is not a metric, okay? But anyway, this is a handy uh, uh, measure of uh, uh, distances, and uh, in this case, we measure the difference of uh, a approximation to the true uh, by a KL from the approximate to the true, not from the true to the approximate, okay? For a good reason, we'll see in a second. 
So this is a good reason. So here I compute the approximation of the KL from the Q to P. Q is the approximating one, P is the true one. Then after you do a few arrangement, you actually will see that at the end of the day, it's equivalent to the negative entropy of the approximating distribution and this uh, expectation of uh, the log distribution under the approximating distribution. Okay. And again, this one is defined to be you know, a Gibbs distribution. Then you can bring in the definition of that, and that becomes basically now the entropy, the negative entropy, okay, minus some constant term. You know, this is the, the partition function, okay. And uh, this one is what? Is the expected log potential, okay, of every clique. And the expectation is taken on Q, supposedly the easy distribution. And that's why we want the Q over P rather than P over Q. Because if you invert that direction, then this guy will be the what? The entropy of P. And this guy will be the expectation under P. And uh, that's basically asking you to do exact inference under the original distribution. It doesn't, you know, it's basically a harder problem because we said the original distribution is too hard to deal with, right? All right, so let's agree on this measure. And uh, then let's uh, see uh, uh, what is the operation problem, okay? So here, the operation function, optimization function is uh, a, QL, a KL between Q and P but uh, only two of the terms are dependent on Q. Therefore, we neglect that uh, log Z. That's another good uh, you know, uh, thing because uh, that one is usually a difficult one, and luckily it is not dependent on Q. Right. I will be with you in a second. So we call them a free energy, and uh, here you can see the flavor of physicists coming in. Okay, physicists are used to call things you know, free energy and uh, entropy and stuff like that. And this one is known as, uh, in fact, uh, Gibbs free energy. All right, and uh, any comments uh, on, on this? Okay, you should be able to actually see uh, what this corresponds to. For example, what does, uh, uh, just help to understand the, the property of the free energy. What is the free energy of uh, P versus P? Uh -huh. Good. And uh, then you should be able to conclude that uh, this one is always bigger than that, right? Yeah. Because uh, you know, KL is always greater and bigger than zero. Okay, you have a question just now? If you are, you know, if you have a lot of things at disposal, you can do that. This is just out of a choice. Yeah, symmetric is better, but it's very, very expensive. And uh, in, dis in probability distribution, uh, such a, in fact, if you do symmetric, then you really are beating your own goal of simplifying a distribution, right? Because, uh, you know, you, you, you want to approach the complex one with a simpler one. Now I want to go back and make things symmetric to use the complex one to approach the simpler one. What's the point? Right. So you give up something. Yeah, one thing in machine learning is that uh, people on the, other hand, on the one hand want a lot of things, but at the other, on the other hand, they don't want to give up anything. And uh, if that's the case, just examine yourself, then you should uh, be a little more flexible. Okay. You just uh, trade off your, you know, your, 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 your power with some flexibility. And that's actually a uh, very important pragmatic uh, attitude in actually doing this business called machine learning, okay? All right, so the energy function now is well defined. It is, uh, just remember, negative entropy plus the expected potential function, okay? And that's basically a objective we can use to pick good approximations. Just remember this. And, uh, and if we take a closer look, you will see that uh, computing this actually is even easier, right? Because uh, all we need is uh, to uh, uh, actually, uh, wh why actually this one is easier, someone can suggest. This is to compute the expectation of uh, a log potential function. 
why I think it is uh, even easier than computing a Q. Any question? Any, any, any suggestion? Okay, just to save time. Because here we need not Q of X. Okay, we only need actually Q of uh, X alpha. Right? Well, as long as we know the marginal of uh, that uh, clique of interest, and we don't need to ask where the marginal come from, they may be coming from the QX, but they may be coming from other source. I have a simple guess, or I have some other way of doing that, then I can directly compute that term. Right, so that's the first uh, bit. And uh, the second one, this uh, entropy function, well, it's becoming a little more kind. You have to deal with the QX itself, so it's a little bit harder. Okay. All right, so uh, now let's uh, talk about uh, a number of different ways of uh, uh, achieving a process inference. In fact, this whole space is uh, rather flexible, and uh, I'm going to enumerate you a few things. So we have now this P of uh, F of P Q, right? That's basically our objective. And our goal is to find a Q, okay, which is the arc max of this. And the Q will be in certain space, in a space of, uh, you know, uh, I don't know how to call it, model, okay, model space of all the Q, or model Q. So this is the optimal optimization problem, by right? finding an easier Q, the approximate P, according to this definition of the quality. That's it. And uh, ideally, you want to solve this directly, okay? And uh, just uh, search in the whole space of Q and uh, over the exact loss function. Now I tell you, this can be hard if you don't give any constraint because if you don't give any constraint, then the optimal solution should be what? Should be P itself. Then you don't actually get uh, the problem solved, right? So we need to, so first of all, define such a space to be smaller. It should be a family of uh, easier distributions. And then we need to run into the case of uh, what we mean by easier, by what measure, right? How to enforce that? That's the first thing. So we need to ask how to define this. And then this loss function itself. Loss function can sometimes be also complicated. What if it is non-convex? What if it is not uh, present uh, computable in closed form? Maybe it's just symbolic, like a rather symbol like that, but it's not computable, okay, or not differentiable, and so on. So this guy should also uh, be set to a question mark. Right? So now I'm going to tell you a bit uh, 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 thought experiment on how we can actually uh, navigate through this uh, whole space of formulation. It turns out that both the MQ and the F are subject to approximation. You can actually change this to be a one that is approximating the true one, for example. And you can basically have uh, such space to be also uh, uh, more kind of uh, uh, easy to deal with. Okay. And the choice of uh, these different dimensions leads you to different uh, families of approximate inference algorithm. So now let's... Uh, uh, look at a, a first proposal for doing this. Again, this is uh, coming out of uh, some uh, traditionally uh, uh, more kind of uh, correct uh, definition, but then we do some twist on top of it. It's just like you know, the same spirit for message passing. It was uh, right on some model, then we abuse it by using it on a place where it is not proper. Right? So here, let's uh, do the same on uh, lost definition, loss function definition, okay? So this is a graph that plays a chain, right? And uh, if you still remember the junction tree property, do you actually remember how can we write down the joint distribution of uh, these uh, eight random variables as uh, a function of uh, the pairwise and the marginal potentials? If you still rem remember. Why we want potential? Because uh, this uh, marginal potential or marginal uh, you know, uh, probability is uh, the query we actually want to solve at the end of the day, right? So what if we can make them to be, uh, um, you know, directly related to the original full distribution? Anybody remember that? The, the so-called uh, 
junction tree property or something. All right, you forgot. Let me uh, do it quickly for you. Uh, if you remember, we actually have uh, this. Actually, oh, okay. So uh, the the numbering here are not uh, from uh, one to eight. I hope you remember this. X. Divided by what? If you remember. No recollection? Okay, let me help you a little bit. Can I put the P of X4 and the X8 downstairs? You cannot, right? Then why this is true? This is basically by definition, right? It's the chain rule of the original distribution, and you just uh, express them in terms of the pairwise potential versus the separator potential. Okay, that's actually how we define originally the joint distribution using the junction tree property, right? All right, so remember this first because it will be useful for us to compute something. So we have now an expression of the joint as a function of uh, the pairwise marginal and a singleton marginal. Okay, remember this first. All right. So with that definition, we actually can compute, uh, uh, you know, two quantities. One is uh, the potential or the, the 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 entropy of that distribution, right? And uh, so I I'm running out of battery in here, but uh, you can just uh, use that definition and uh, directly compute the entropy based on the definition of the entropy. And uh, I hope you can get this. Okay, there are two terms here. One is basically, uh, what is that? This is the entropy of uh, every clique marginal. This is the entropy of uh, every singleton marginal weighted by the degree of that marginal divided by a degree minus one. Okay, what's the trick in here? Well, it basically tells you why the last two terms are not there, right? If uh, this one has a degree one, and the degree one minus one means degree, there's a zero, therefore that term vanishes, right? But uh, for this one, it has a degree two minus one that keep this guy on downstairs. That's why it's kept, right? So with this uh, tree form, we can actually write down in close form the entropy of that distribution. That's why we call it the entropy tree, okay? And uh, okay, and then uh, remember what's the definition of the free energy of a distribution? It is the minus entropy, negative entropy, uh, plus the expected uh, potential, right? So we have uh, this guy, the negative entropy introduced in here, because it's a negative sign here, and uh, here are the expected <coughs> potential, right? Expected pairwise potential, and uh, in here we have the same thing. We basically need to revert the sign for that, right? And uh, if you look at this term a little bit more carefully, and uh, um, it replace uh, them with some symbols you actually will see now that there are functions of uh, these guys, each correspond to a edge, okay, on the graph, and then the singleton functions, each correspond to, you know, a particular node in the graph 
other than the two terminal nodes, which uh, has a, a degree one. Okay. So why I do this? Well, this is uh, my uh, uh, slides to convince you that uh, there is a closed form way of writing down the free energy for a distribution defined on a tree. Okay. So in other words, you know, writing down this uh, this uh, tree function here, or this uh, free energy function here, can be easy for a certain model. Okay. But uh, interestingly, if it is easy to write for that free energy, you don't need uh, a approximation anyway, because that, that inference problem on those models are also easy. It's a tree, right? So the real interesting problem is uh, a complex model where you know, the inference is not feasible, and also writing down that uh, loss function is also not easy. Okay. All right. All right, so now let me see. I'm going to introduce a definition, okay, called uh, the best free energy approximation to the Gibbs energy, which says the following. It says, regardless of the shape, the structure of the graph, I'm going to define a thing called uh, the best free energy, which uh, contain the following components. First of all, the best entropy is going to be exactly aligned with uh, the form of my tree entropy. Okay, it's going to be the expected uh, log potential and uh, degree minus one times the expected uh, singleton potential. That's it. Regarding, regardless of uh, the shape, the topology of the graph, I'm going to insist on these two components. Okay by definition. For example, if I have a graph where a node is involved like this, then that node has a degree of four, right? And that means that this uh, uh, particular potential need to be subtracted three times, okay? And uh, accordingly, I'm going to define the best free energy to be also aligned with the tree free energy, okay? Uh, which is uh, the expectation on the log of uh, the marginal potential divided by the marginal clique. And uh, here, the same thing, one minus degree times the expected singleton marginal. Okay? And uh, so I call this uh, the expected free energy and uh, whatever. Okay, so what's the big deal of that? Well, the big deal of that is that uh, now, you know, we have at least a way to define the something called the free energy regardless of the graphical model configuration. For example, this graphical model, what is the difference of this graphical model to the previous one? We have a few more edges. We have this one, this one, and this one, which create a whole lot of cycles, right? And uh, now, you should at least remember that with all this cycle, the previous way of writing down the joint is no longer valid. Okay, because uh, it is not uh, anymore a junction tree. And therefore, that definition or that computation of uh, the free energy is not actually the right energy for this one. Okay, if you just, uh, you know, if you can write anyway a expression of the margin of the joint of this whole distribution and put them back to the joint distribution, uh, put them back to the definition of the energy, you get something else rather than the so-called the best free energy. Okay, all right. But why we like best free energy? Because it is simple. It is only defined on a pairwise term and also a singleton term and weighted by some numbers which are relevant to their degrees, right? And it's very natural, you know, for three degree nodes, you minus twice, and for one degree nodes, you subtract once. All intuitive, okay? And that's actually the first strategy people take to actually simplify the operation problem. We at least make the free energy definable in a closed form. Okay, so uh, free energy. The, the, the prongs is uh, easy to compute, right? And uh, the cons, of course, is very interesting. Oh, by the way, this is uh, easy to compute in what sense? 
Well, in many sense, because uh, it only requires you to compute uh, uh, B of X alpha, right? Because that's the only thing you need to use to compute the excitation of F alpha and so on and so forth. And uh, one important thing to remember is that uh, computing B of X alpha does not require you to necessarily deal with the Q of X as a whole. You can get uh, the marginal through some other means directly in many cases without worrying about the whole distribution, how they look like. But uh, the cons is also very uh, serious, right? So now we put a hat on this uh, free energy, and uh, we use the, uh, the, the, the best free energy to replace that. And this one actually has uh, an unknown relationship of the true free energy. OK, so uh, in fact, I should write this. That's the first thing we need to realize. They are unequal. But uh, worse than that, they are not only unequal, their relationship, their relative magnitude is not clear. Suppose, for example, you have this function, okay, which is your true free energy, and uh, we may want to optimize it as a function of the parameters or something, or we want to remember in our likelihood learning, we want to learn a model which uh, push the likelihood, right? And uh, if you cannot push the likelihood of the original function, sometimes we hope, how about we push the lower bound of that? Therefore, if the lower bound is pushed up, the original function can also hopefully be pushed up. But this guy is very strange. This can, can sometimes be bigger than the free energy and be sometimes lower than, than the, the free energy. Therefore, it's actually unknown in terms of its relationship to the true free energy. Okay. But anyway, this is a, 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 a breakthrough in physics people uh, actually getting a Nobel Prize uh, because uh, it offers a way to approximate free energy with an interpretation. You can see where it comes from already, right? It is to define now free energy on the grid world. In the atomic uh, physics uh, you know, research, you know, the, the basic uh, atomic structure or the, uh, la the lattice structure, the crystal structure is the lattice. And uh, that's basically like salt, for example, like, right? And, uh, you know, uh, uh, sodium chloride, for example, is like this. And uh, they actually want to use uh, this uh, best free energy to compute the energy state okay, of uh, 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 atomic physics entity. And then I have uh, an uh, approximate loss function, okay, which is now a function of what? A function of uh, my B of uh, X alpha, right? Which is uh, the the message, basically, the marginal of every clique, every pairwise clique, and also B of I, which is a singleton thing. Right? And therefore, one way of solving a approximate problem is to directly find those, okay, which becomes the argmax of the FB. So this is uh, a uh, interesting approximate inference problem where we relax the loss function from F to FB, and then we also change the, the optimization objective a little bit. Originally, we are optimizing over the best choice of Q. Now we forget about Q. We directly worry about the messages okay, coming supposedly realized you know, by this distribution. But we don't worry about the original distribution. So there isn't a need to explicitly express the true Joint distribution. Okay, so that's basically a step. So, so now you wonder why I talk about all this. This has nothing to do with my B propagation message passing thing, right? It's, it's becoming now what studying physics. It's like uh, doing energy minimization as a result of uh, potentials. But uh, that's where the two papers I mentioned, you know, from uh, the MIT school uh, uh, researchers made this a uh, key connection they found that uh, these two algorithms are actually doing the same thing. Okay. So here is the catch. Okay, we have now the best free energy defined as follows on arbitrary graph. The key here is that uh, I ignore the original graph structure, only focus on, uh, on click potential, single potential, and the click potential are represented as this. The single potential are represented as this. I only worry about their local degree. Uh, complexity, 
And then I'm going to now directly, you know, solve uh, uh, a, uh, a optimization problem for looking for best bi and b alpha. So now, what is the bi and the b alpha? They are the marginal distribution of uh, local cliques and uh, singletons, right? And uh, in that, uh, we should uh, enforce some constraints so that they are at least valid potentials, uh, valid uh, uh, local marginals for clique or singletons, right? So how should we actually enforce that constraint? Or uh, what are the constraints? Yeah, so the constraint will be maybe for you know, b of uh, xi, sum over all the i, they should equal to what? One. To one, right? And uh, maybe for b of uh, x alpha over all the x alpha, they should also belong to one, right? And also, of course, this is for all, all the i and all the alpha. What else? Are these enough? They should have this uh, local consistency thing. For example, if, uh, uh, for example, these two potentials, they are sharing this node, what should happen? I should have something like this, right? B of uh, X alpha, uh, sorry. You can take this time to think while I'm erasing. Alpha minus I should uh, give me B of uh, X I, right? Right, so that seems to be the only requirements I need to have, basically, to make sure that uh, at least locally, all these Bs are legitimate. Right? They are valid uh, you know, local marginals. OK, that's it. And then how should we actually bring them into my optimization problem? It's pretty uh, straightforward, right? Using a like, Lagrangian multiplier and build a big Lagrangian on that. Right, so that's what's happening here. I have the FB, and then I have a, a few Lagrangian multipliers and uh, to actually introduce all my constraints. And uh, that's my problem. Okay, that's basically a, uh, a loss minimization problem. And uh, I'm going to now take the derivative of L with respect to B alpha and uh, this over B of I. And I encourage you actually to go home and do it. Okay, in fact, it's not, it's not easy, it's uh, not, not, not difficult. It's maybe a half an hour exercise. But once you did that, you will find something quite interesting, okay? You will find the B to be, you know, it's a very simple expression, like this. And the, the B alpha is something like this, okay? <coughs> so for an uh, unexperienced eye, like what I had, you know, a couple of years ago, even up to here, I don't really see the light, I, I, okay, that's uh, uh, maybe like a exponential distribution, very nice, but then what? Okay, so I don't know how they figure this out, but uh, in that paper by Yair Weiss et al., they basically made this uh, leap of thought. They realized that maybe the Lagrangian multipliers, you know, which actually is a function of uh, that particular state, because every Lagrangian multiplier is coupled with a particular configuration where the constraint has to hold, right? Remember, we are basically saying the constraint happens on a particular clique, on a particular uh, variable configuration. So they are going to now you know, make a connection of this uh, Lagrangian you know, to, they call them just uh, the message, okay? I can rename it, you know, lambda, uh, replaced by i, uh, by m is not a big deal, it's just a different name, right? And uh, then what's uh, more interesting is uh, uh, they start to realize that once you make this uh, redefinition, then this, uh, you know, uh, singleton marginal and this uh, clique marginal can all be expressed in this way, okay? Isn't that amazing? This is uh, something we saw before, right? This is exactly the same equation we actually used to run belief propagation on a graph, okay? And we have uh, the click message and uh, the singleton message, 
and uh, if the definition, you know, look at, they are the same as this, other than you are willing to change the notation from lambda to log m. Okay. All right, so up to here, what do we get? Well, the thing we want to get is that this is our old BP algorithm, okay, and now we call them LBP, loopy BD propagation, because uh, we are willing to write on any graph. And then that uh, best free energy minimization problem is also what we call to be an approximation to arbitrary distribution with arbitrary graph, because the best free energy is meant to simplify the definition of the loss over arbitrary graphic model. And uh, by solving that best minimization, we have a procedure which look the same as my message passing algorithm, okay, at least algebraically. All right? So that's the, actually the, 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 the ingenious part, right? So you should now come to the following conclusion. We have now a factor tree, and the factor tree, or any graphic model that can be written as a factor tree, can be now expressed uh, for a loss function versus its approximation by a free energy. This is the general definition of free energy. And then I'm willing to replace that uh, true free energy, which is uh, complex to approximate or to even express by a approximating free energy, which is called the best free energy. Right? And uh, that best free energy is nice in the sense that uh, they ignore the global graphical structure and they only use the local marginal, the local potential, and the singleton marginal and their degree to actually come up with the form. Right? And uh, minimizing this guy with respect to the B alpha and the Bi gets you this equation. And this equation is identical to the message passing equation we applied originally without knowing all this business on the graphical model. Right. So what do you conclude? It means that the mysterious loopy bit propagation that people applied anyway to arbitrary graph without knowing what's going on is actually implicitly you know, solving a constraint optimization problem defined by the best free energy. Okay. So that's basically what's happening in the uh, in, the, in the late 90s, people for the first time established a variational inference heuristic with something very fundamental in energy minimization, okay, with uh, explicit loss function and uh, with explicit, uh, you know, a space of uh, minimization and all that. So this algorithm become fully justified after that, okay? So this is uh, a, a story I want, to, I want you to actually uh, appreciate, okay? Just to repeat, you know, we are in the space of uh, introducing a loss and, uh, and uh, you know, the, the argument of the, uh, the variables in the optimization, right? And, uh, <coughs> and now what do we mean by a variational method is to turn the original probabilistic inference problem, okay, as this, uh, you know, optimization problem which of course involves defining a loss and defining a optimization space in here, okay? And the, the loopy BD propagation is just uh, one particular choice of uh, this guy and this guy and this guy. All three gets, cho gets, gets chosen, right? This guy, the chosen uh, objective is this, and the uh, Q is chosen to be not the f original Q, but uh, the pairwise marginal and the singleton marginal, right? And uh, what is S? The space of that is what? It's anything that uh, satisfies local consistency, right? So that's basically the picture I want you to remember. All right, so that's what I basically expressed explicitly. You know, you have uh, all this uh, now exposed explicitly. Maybe I should say a few words about this, okay? The M space is my true space of, uh, of uh, all probabilistic distributions that is valid, okay? And uh, usually, you know, if, uh, you know, when, once we go further into our later lectures, you will realize that it is sometimes expressed as uh, a polytope, okay? Polytope is like this. 
Why is a polytope? Because uh, it is defined by some linear constraints. Remember our uh, exponential family distribution? We basically have these uh, margin constraints that uh, the, you know, uh, the entropy, uh, the, 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 the mean uh, parameter is uh, basically equal to the empirical mean, so on and so forth, and they have to be satisfy certain values you know, we are going to discuss later. But anyway, it's basically defined by a bunch of linear uh, you know, constraints. And uh, now, you know, what's happening in the LBP, okay, is basically to relax these uh, constraints. What do you mean by relax? It means that uh, let's forget about uh, how the Q actually should behave. Let's just worry about uh, how the B alpha and the BI behave. And all they need to behave is to make sure that uh, they satisfy the, the, these constraints, right? Do you think this one is bigger or smaller than the original space? Bigger. Yeah, it is actually bigger. It is bigger but in a unique way. It is actually touching all these corners. Because uh, the truth distribution and the, your uh, you know, replacement should, should agree on certain points. Right, at least on that marginal, they should, they, should, they should agree on each other. Therefore, all these corners actually will agree on each other. Therefore, it's called a outer approximation to the original space. Okay. And later, we're going to learn the inner approximation, but that's basically the, the point. You, know, you replace the target with a base, you replace the space with an outer approximation, and uh, you replace your goal from the original distribution to the singleton and the clique marginal, and you solve it, and that gives you the LBP. Okay, any questions on the loopy belief? Yeah. So theoretically, the fact that loopy belief propagation doesn't work is from the... It, no, 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 who says it doesn't work? <laughs> if it doesn't work, it's, uh -huh. uh, it's not a theoretically uh, principled thing to do, it's because the test tree energy approximation itself... Can be a cool, yeah, can be a poor one. That's exactly the reason, right? So uh, if you believe doing this is right, then what you do is already correct. But uh, this very, very choice of the loss could be flawed, okay? And uh, for certain distribution, it can be a very good choice. For other distribution, it can be a terrible one, okay? And uh, there isn't a clear insight about uh, which one, uh, whether it is good or not. So the common wisdom is that just go run it and hope for the best. If it doesn't converge, then forget about it. Try something else. All right, any other questions? We're doing okay, we at least finished one algorithm. I have another one, which I meant to say a few words, but, uh, but this one is the most important. Uh, all right, so at least uh, now you see uh, this uh, uh, loopy belief heuristic has a, a good foundation, and also you see the bigger picture of uh, variational inference, and now maybe uh, we should do a f another one. Uh, maybe let me show you just the uh, the, the, the essence of this mathematically first, and then next lecture we can explain some more. So as I said, the whole point is to really uh, solve this problem with uh, relaxations on the loss and uh, you know, uh, the space and uh, all that. So one alternative is uh, this, right? How about uh, we just uh, set the loss function as it is? Okay, we don't replace by bias free energy or anything. Okay, and, uh, but uh, because this, this free energy, after all, is a function of the Q. And uh, maybe I should make the Q extremely special so that uh, even computing the free energy under Q is feasible. That's actually one decision I, I can make. So I'm going to have the exact Q. Okay, at least the wish respect to the Q. And then I'm going to now design a space of Q which uh, is uh, uh, special. Okay, and I'm going to design such that uh, it is very simple. For example, I designed the Q to be a bunch of uh, Q alpha over X alpha. I directly designed the joint distribution to be a product of uh, clique marginals. Directly designed that. Remember, originally, the B alphas, when they multiply together, does not equal to the true distribution, right? Because they have overlapping and other things. But now I'm going to do this in the sense that uh, I'm going to enforce all the x alphas. They are no longer cliques, 
they are just the arbitrary cluster of nodes in my graph, and then I intentionally make them discrete. Okay, basically I have a bigger graph. Yeah, I mean I can I can draw one like this. I have a lot of nodes. I just cut them into four pieces, and I call this Q1, call this Q2. I just multiply their local marginals together, by definition. Okay, so that's a space. And uh, then I'm going to now, you know, of course, every Q of uh, X alpha is uh, something I don't know, right? I'm going to decide on a uh, distribution family first, how this Q look like, a Gaussian or a multinomial, I don't know, but I'm going to make a choice. And then I'm going to introduce something called uh, a variational parameter, okay? Their parameters has to be optimized. And then I'm going to now solve uh, this problem, solve the parameter such that, uh, you know, argument of uh, E under Q, which is exact, and also under entropy of Q. So again, why actually I say this one can be now made exact, can be made exact? It's because the definition of the free energy contains these two pieces. One is the expected energy or the expected log potential the other is the entropy itself. If I make the Q to be such an easier form, which is a product of a multiple marginals, what does this boils to? Well, this one is already easy because we know that uh, it only requires you to have uh, clique potentials. What about this one for a, a simplified Q? E equals to the sum of uh, all the cluster marginals, okay? Yeah, and uh, later on, we're going to discuss uh, how this can be exactly done, and technically, this amounts to choosing the exact loss, and uh, now, in the space of optimization, I'm going to choose an inner space, okay, that allow me to find the optimal solution to that. So that's mean field approximation, and the uh, mean field approximation is much wider used than uh, the BD propagation for a good reason. First of all, computationally, it will be very easy if you find out. Secondly, because the loss function is exact, it is always guaranteed to be a lower bound of the likelihood. You actually, you know, the lower bound can be very poor. Maybe it's far away from the likelihood, but at least it is a lower bound. You cannot uh, you know, expect such thing happen that you are optimizing this, but the likelihood actually drops. It wouldn't happen. Okay, so uh, with that, uh, you know, for example, the nowadays topic model, a half of the inference algorithm for topic model is based on that, uh, uh, on, uh, ver um, on mean field approximations. All right, so much for today. I'm going to uh, call off, and uh, I need to go to uh, the daycare to pick up my son right now. So uh, if you are coming to my office hour, you can wait outside of my office just for a few minutes. Okay, thanks. <laughs>